is time for some extreme ITX cooling and that is exactly what we're getting with this system right here. Some of you may have seen my recent video where I crammed a Ryzen 5950X and an RTX 3090 into a 9.5 litre case. That didn't work out so well. The bottom line there was that we just needed way more radiator volume for that setup to be viable, which is where this build comes in. It's only around three liters larger in volume, but it offers so much more cooling because in here are two 240 mil radiators, one of them being 40 millimeters thick. So really, really excited to talk about this one and how it's all put together. And more importantly, the thermal and noise performance. Now I've actually been using this system for around two weeks now and I'll just say that it has been an absolute 180 compared to my previous build in the T1. This build has so much cooling available that you can run the RTX 3090 at its full 350 watts while still getting very good thermals and noise levels. This is definitely a build that I plan on running for quite a while. It's also not that much bigger than my previous build in the T1, around 13 liters versus just under 10 liters. My main concern for keeping this compact was so that I could reasonably fit it behind my TV when playing more casual games out there, and it does that quite easily. Now, most of the components in that build in the T1 are actually the same in here. I've used most of the same components, except for the CPU and the motherboard. As most of you know, I've had problems with basically any Ryzen 5000 CPU plugged into the B550 iStrix or X570 iStrix motherboard. Specifically, the boost clocks were just so much lower than what I had expected. And I never ended up resolving this issue on those boards, but performance looks mostly fine on the board that we're using this time around. This is the ASUS X570 Crosshair 8 Impact, which is an absolutely stacked mini DTX motherboard. This board won't fit in sandwich layout cases like the T1 or Ghost S1, but it will fit in the N case. Tons of enthusiast features packed into this one, and this easily has the best rear IO that I've seen on any any ITX or DTX board. That includes a postcode readout, clear CMOS and BIOS flashback. It has the same VRM as the X570 iStrix, but you also get a few more onboard headers, full PWM control over the two built-in 40mm fans, as well as an onboard power button. Most importantly though, it's the boost clock performance that looks pretty solid on this board using the latest BIOS revision and chipset drivers. We're getting boost clock performance here in Blender, which lines up pretty closely with what I achieved on the MSI X570 creation, which I used for my Ryzen 5000 review. All right, now in terms of the custom loop, this is pretty much as dense as it gets. We've got two 240 mil radiators. The one at the bottom is the XSPC TX240 Ultra Slim paired with slim Noctua Chromax fans. And then on the side, we've got the 240 mil Coolstream PE rad from EK. That's 40 mils in thickness and appropriately has two Noctua NFA 12 by 25s. Now, when it comes to the pump and reservoir, honestly, my first preference would have been the Barrow CPU pump lock that I've reviewed previously, but I didn't have an AM4 version on hand. So instead I went with the legendary Iceman pump res combo that mounts the rear of the end case. And this turned out so well that this is actually what I'll end up leaving on here. Filling the entire loop was extremely easy, just pouring directly into the reservoir. And the pump is the same that I was using in my previous build in the T1. It's the SwiftTech MCP35X. Now an obvious concern with mounting a pump on the outside of the case is noise level, right? It doesn't have the sound insulation of all of your system components as you would if you were mounting it on the inside. So this is something that I was really concerned with, but as you can see now, the system is on and you can't hear the pump. This pump here from SwiftTech is really something. Uh, at idle, you can't hear it at all, even on the outside of the case. And even at load at around 3000 RPM, it does get audible, but it's not really uh, an annoying noise. And certainly you can't really hear it that loud over the fans. 
Also keep in mind that with this setup, you will have two cables running from the pump. Those can easily be fed through the third expansion slot if you just leave that open. Now let's go through a quick tour of the loop and how everything is connected. So starting from the pump, there's a very short tubing run to the inlet of the GPU. And for both ports on the GPU block, I've used an 8mm extender, a 90 degree low profile fitting from Coolant, and an EK torque compression fitting. The GPU is then connected to the bottom mounted radiator via a 90 degree compression fitting and a 28 mil extender. That way the tubing run is pretty straightforward. Then on the other side of that bottom radiator, I've got a coolant sensor, more on that in a moment, and a 45 degree compression fitting that leads to the quick disconnect fitting for the side mounted radiator. I've then used a few more 90 degree fittings here, as well as another EK torque extender fitting. Then this connects to another quick disconnect fitting, and this allows the radiator to be completely disconnected from the loop without any draining necessary. Then we have the CPU block, two 90 degree fittings there. And then lastly, another 90 degree fitting for the DDC pump inlet. It did take a while to get this all figured out, but I'm super happy with how it looks and probably wouldn't have done anything different in hindsight. One problem that you will encounter though, if you are using the ASUS X570 Crosshair 8 Impact in addition to a bottom mounted radiator in this case, is that you won't actually be able to install the bottom radiator with screws screws since the motherboard will kind of block it out of position. So instead for this build, I've just used extremely strong double-sided tape to hold that bottom radiator in place. It sounds super janky, but trust me, that thing is not going anywhere. Now something new with this build, which I'll definitely be using for all of my liquid cooled builds moving forward is a coolant temperature sensor. It's as simple as it sounds. It measures the temperature of the coolant wherever you put it in the loop. And then given that your motherboard actually has a two pin temperature sensor, you should be able to set that as the source for your radiator fans. And I am planning on doing a full video on this coolant temperature sensor and how to set it up and how to kind of optimize it and what you need to know, because it is easily one of my favorite parts of this entire build. Even aside from performance, aside from looks, that coolant temperature sensor just is a complete game changer. So again, full video coming soon. It's a much more logical way of setting up the loop and kind of ramping up the fan speed, as well as the fan speed and the fan curve just being way smoother than anything else that I've built previously. Finally though, the best part, let's talk about thermals. And let's start with gaming thermals first because that's what really pushed my previous system over the edge. So here we're looking at Witcher 3 running at 4K for 30 minutes, all of the radiator fans are set to a quiet 1300 RPM and the pump is set to 3200 RPM. Our RTX 3090 running with stock power and voltage settings settles at just 62 degrees C. So this is with this GPU pumping as much heat as it possibly can into the loop, you know, not holding back at all and it's still within a very reasonable safe temperature. Our Ryzen 5900X is also within a very reasonable temperature here as well, averaging out to just above 70C. So this compact loop can handle the 5900X and 3090 without having to modify the voltage or power settings. But if you do want to undervolt the GPU, you can drop a further four degrees here, in this case, getting us down to 58C with a room ambient of 22. And again, this is with the fan set to just 13 RPM, which is very quiet. You could definitely reduce the thermals a bit further by ramping them up to say 1600 RPM, but that's not how I plan on using this system. And I did see quite a few comments on my previous video saying, what is even the point of undervolting an RTX 3090? At that point, you should just buy a 3080. But surprisingly, our undervolt profile with this GPU set to just above 1800 megahertz actually had the GPU operating at a higher clock speed for this scenario. So for this game and resolution, you'd actually be gaining performance, not losing it. However, this won't be the case for every game out there. In easier to run games or lower resolutions, you'll likely see clock speeds around the 1850 megahertz mark. And in esports titles, you'll likely see it in excess of 1900 megahertz. So for sure, in those scenarios, there will be a very minor performance hit. Although I don't think I'd personally be able to notice a difference between 480 FPS and 500 FPS in Valorant. For those more demanding 4K titles though, I think performance will be about roughly equal with this undervolt enabled. Then when we take a look at GPU rendering in Blender using cycles and optics for the GPU, it comfortably levels out at just 56C. Overall, I'm super happy with GPU thermals for this system. 
system, but CPU thermals are a lot more of an interesting story, especially because this is my first AMD Ryzen build. At first, CPU thermals can look quite alarming, even more so because you'll potentially see warmer thermals and bigger peaks under lighter threaded workloads, as opposed to an all-core workload like Blender or video exporting. And this sounds completely backwards, right? Why would the CPU get hotter in a less demanding workload like our gaming, for example, as opposed to something like exporting? And the reason for that is that despite the CPU not operating at its full power threshold in those lighter workloads, it is sending a higher proportion of its power limit to a fewer amount of cores. So that's why those fewer amount of cores end up getting hotter and those are those thermals and those peaks that you end up seeing. Take Cinebench for example executing on a single thread. This pushes our Ryzen 5900X to peak temperatures of around 78 degrees C which just sounds completely wrong and then when we take a closer look we can see that that's only for one of the two chiplets of the CPU. So despite the CPU reporting pretty warm temperatures it's not actually getting that hot. We can see this when we also take a look at the core coolant temperature for the system, which barely heats up at all. So cooling performance for both the CPU and the GPU, I'm super happy with moving forward. Again, there's no user intervention needed to kind of modify the power and voltage, although I probably will undervolt the GPU just to kind of save a few degrees here and there. But I feel like I've spoken about the thermals and the little tweaks here and there a little bit too long because taking a big step back, the best thing about this system is just the uncompromising performance. This thing is brutally quick in everything I can throw at it. Video editing is buttery smooth and 4K gaming is unbelievably quick. I'm consistently seeing above 100 frames per second in demanding titles at high settings and that's while being super compact and very quiet. With a Ryzen 5900X and RTX 3090, this is pretty much the fastest gaming PC configuration that you can build right now. And I'm also relieved to have so much video memory at my disposal for editing and rendering. It's basically something that I'll never have to worry about again. So it's a big upgrade from my previous system, some extreme cooling for this one and I'll leave all of the parts linked down below in the description that I can find. As always, a huge thanks for watching and I will see you all in the next one.